uh, these two instincts. Okay, just cool. getting my thing going. Okay. Dr. Dave Kilcullen, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. It's great to finally be on here with you guys. Yeah, I'm excited to speak with you too. Let's start here. You are a person who served in the Australian military. You are an expert in counterinsurgency. We're going to get into that because the broad topic I'd like to focus on you is this idea of lessons learned from the past 20 years, how Russia is thinking about all these realities. But let's just start with your military assessment with what is happening on the ground in Ukraine right now. Well, the very big picture is that about a week ago, the Russians threw out the complete playbook that they've been employing for about 20 years, right? So we're in a bit of a new world. Um, for 20 years uh, under Vladimir Putin, the Russians have done incredibly well with this kind of incremental, ambiguous um, approach, doing just enough to get what they want, but not enough to trigger a major response. And... Um, you know, that's worked well for them in a variety of places. But, uh, you know, this time last week, they threw that out the window and went for the jugular to really try to quickly seize and decapitate the uh, Ukrainian government. That failed on the first day of the war. And now they're into kind of a sledgehammer, you know, um, like Pac-Man, you know, gobbling their way through uh, Ukrainian cities. And I think what we're going to see from them is... The kinds of tactics we saw from them in Aleppo, in Syria, uh, in Grozny, in Chechnya, which bodes very ill for Ukrainian civilians, right? But I think that the big picture sort of macro point that, you know, people that have a life and, and don't track Russia for a living, right, need to get on board is that this is a major departure from what the Russians have been doing in the past. And we, we all need to be kind of updating our priors, you know, about, about what we think is, uh, is really driving uh, Russia and what's going to happen next. So let's start with what they have been doing in Aleppo and Grozny and what, what that means for Ukrainian civilians. Yeah, so 1994, the opening of the war in Chechnya, the Russians pulled off something rather similar to what we've seen in Ukraine. They, they pushed a major tank column uh, with some supporting infantry armored vehicles down a main road, um, 120 vehicles in the, in the lead group just all of them driving nose to tail down the road, very much like that famous convoy that's been kicking around north of Kiev for the last few days. Um, they ran into major ambushes in the urban environment. They lost 105 out of 120 vehicles in that first column and lost an entire battalion who got surrounded. It's about 600 guys who got surrounded by uh, Chechen guerrillas and massacred in, uh, in the center of the city in the, the railway station of Grozny. And as a result, they backed off, brought up huge firepower, and then just effectively leveled the city, right? By, it took them three and a half months to actually capture the city. They went block by block with just really heavy artillery. And, you know, you can illustrate the degree of damage by just one fact point, which is that the Russian headquarters, one of the biggest problems they had when they occupied the city months later was finding an undamaged building in order to put their headquarters in there. Um, and we saw a rather similar approach in uh, Aleppo where the Syrians and the Russians initially tried to push into the city and got smacked. And so they engaged in sort of modern siege warfare tactics and effectively reduced the city to rubble over months in order to uh, control it. So I think the, the risk for Ukrainian civilians now is that the Russians revert to that Grozny Aleppo playbook and they just reduce these cities to smoking hulks um, uh, while simultaneously running various efforts to try to still decapitate the current Ukrainian government and replace it with a puppet regime that's going to do some kind of deal. So I think you're going to see this twin track, right? The Pac-Man chewing its way through Ukrainian cities and simultaneously GRU, which is Russian military intelligence, and Spetsnaz, which is their special operations forces, launching these kind of assassination and sabotage teams that we've been seeing uh, to try to kill or capture the, you know, the group around Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. And for context for the audience, because I don't think most Americans have heard the word Chechnya 
in decades, mm. give the context on Chechnya, because it's actually very important to where we're about to go in terms of political military objectives. Yeah. What, what, what was the issue in Chechnya in the 1990s and what actually is Chechnya? So Soviet Union fell apart on Christmas Day, 1991. A number of former Soviet republics began to break away and declare their own independence. One of those was Chechnya, which is in the far south of Russia in the Caucasus. So the, the land uh, isthmus that joins um, uh, Russia to Georgia and then on to, to Azerbaijan and, and Iran. So that southern area. Um, and uh, those guys were um, irregulars, uh, paramilitaries. Many of them had fought in uh, Afghanistan. Um, at the initial phase of the war, there was not a significant, um, you know, religious extremism element to the conflict. It was really just nationalism. The leader of the um, the breakaway republic was actually a former Soviet Air Force general. You know, so it wasn't a a, a religious war. But um, Boris Yeltsin at the time um, didn't see it as acceptable for a country like Chechnya to or a, a region like Chechnya to break away from Russia. And so this was an internal operation against Russian citizens to try to um, prevent that breakaway of, of the Republic. So <clears throat> again, if this is what they were willing to do to their own people, um, you know, uh, think about what they might be willing to do to Ukrainians here. Um, I, it's also worth pointing out there were two wars in Chechnya, one from 1994 to 1996, and then the Yeltsin government backed off. Um, and in that period between 96 and 99, Radical Islamic groups did become more important in Chechnya as kind of an early example of the what I've called the accidental guerrilla syndrome. Um, and uh, Vladimir Putin, as his first act as prime minister and then president of Russia, launched another war in Chechnya, the one which did all that damage that we were talking about earlier. Um, there have been persistent rumors in Russia that it was done on false pretenses, that FSB, which is the successor to the KGB, carried out various false flag incidents, um, blowing up apartment buildings in Moscow and elsewhere and blaming that on Chechen separatists. And that created the, the pretext, right, for the invasion. But I think the other, in addition to just the, that Pac-Man we've talked about, the other innovation that we saw from Vladimir Putin was making an ally of the, um, if you like, strongmen of, of Chechnya, uh, and putting them in charge and letting them do the dirty work for him. And one of the fears we're seeing now in Ukraine is that there are actually quite a lot of Chechens in the um, in the attack groups that are coming into uh, Ukraine. And the, the Chechen strongmen have sort of become like the shock troops of uh, the Putin clique in, uh, in, in Moscow. And I think we're going to see a bit more of that uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, I'd love for you to explain what the accidental guerrilla references. So you obviously, this is a concept um, that you've coined. You wrote a book on this back in 2008. So just explain what accidental gorillas are. Yeah. I mean, it's actually a pretty obvious, um, you know, observation that, um, you know, but you never, you never lose money writing books on obvious shit, right? Um, the, uh, uh, or can I say shit on your podcast? Sorry. Yes. Um, so uh, anyway, the, uh, the idea is basically, Extremists, um, without necessarily having very much popular support, move into a population group that causes panic, um, triggers us to then go in and invade or disrupt in some way to try to um, deal with those extremists. And a very, very large number of people end up getting extremely pissed off, not because they support the extremists, but because we just invaded their country or we just droned their grandmother or something like that. And what you actually get is what I call accidental guerrillas, people that are fighting us, not because they hate us, but because we're in their face. And obviously the classic example of that was Iraq and Afghanistan, but we've seen it also in Somalia, um, in Pakistan, um, to some extent in Libya, a whole variety of other places. And uh, I think, you know, the, the application of that here is that you know, the, the line that the Russians have taken is that the Ukrainian state is dominated by a small clique of gangsters who are also neo-Nazis, which is kind of laughable. With a, Jew, with a, with a Jewish president. With a Jewish head, of president who was elected with 73% of the vote. So obviously uh, these, these are a rather uh, unusual- The craftiest Nazis we've ever seen yeah, at this point. Right. <laughs> Devilishly clever, right? Voting in a Jewish president. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the, the argument is like, there's a small number of extremists. We don't hate the Ukrainian people. We're just in there with what the Russians call a special military operation to deal with that. And of course, that's not how Ukrainians see it. And everyone's defending their families and their homes. And there's going to be a mass uprising slant insurgency against this. And it's just a European example of the, of the accidental guerrilla syndrome. Yeah, what's so useful there, and this is really where our experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan should teach us something, it's easy to put an ideological bent to everything that's happening. You could talk about, insert, hate us for our freedoms, or radical Islamic terrorism. Obviously, that's a very real thing, You know, insert ISIS statement there. But the dynamic you're describing, especially when you're in some corner of Afghanistan, is actually deeply important. So like, that's why this is a, like you said, it's simple, but you'd be shocked. Well, you wouldn't be shocked because you lived through this, but I think listeners would be shocked at how difficult it was to intuit such a simple point. So let's, let's talk about the differences though between Grozny and Aleppo. So in those cases, what makes counterinsurgency and insurgency such a fascinating topic to me as a non-military person is it's, it's a weird mix of military power, but economic power and political power. So, so actual objectives. So if you're looking at Chechnya in the 1990s, the political objective for, for Boris Yeltsin is to keep Russia together. Um, you had all these breaker Republicans and Republics in 1991, and it seems clear in 94, the Chechens missed their window and they've drawn a line in the sand. This isn't the Soviet Union. This is Russia. We are keeping Russia constituted together. And when they're making the calculus about leveling cities, destroying the breaker Republic, politically, that is fine because aside from just the human immorality of that strategy, it accomplishes the broader political goal of maintaining the integrity of Russia and preventing further breakaway republics. Once again, in Syria, broad objective, keeping their ally Basar al-Assad in control of the country. If you level Aleppo, that's fine because he remains in power in that context. But here though, what is the political objective that would necessitate the downsides of this strategy? Because like you said, Every single second that you level a Ukrainian city, it gets harder and harder to maintain the denazification argument. It gets harder and harder and harder to impose a puppet government. And, you know, with every day, this becomes more of a quisling, Vichy France type situation. So, and then the final point here would basically be, there's also the external factor of the massive sanctions and Frank just complete pull out and damage to the Russian economy. So the political military strategy they're pursuing is causing significant damage here. So can you just talk about this dynamic? Because that's where I think this breaks away from those two previous examples in terms of the dynamic. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And this is what I meant by saying that the Russians have thrown out their playbook, right, in the last week. I mean, this is a level of violence and a level of overt aggression from them that we've not seen at any time in the post-Soviet period, right? So it's a completely new um, behavior, although it's founded in Russian uh, theory and Russian doctrine and ways of thinking about conflict that are that are longstanding. But it, it's a real departure from uh, what they've done in the past. So as you say, the question is why, right? Now, the, the immediate, um, you know, pretext is this issue of denazification and so on. Let's set that aside for a minute. There is a real issue uh, in the minds of Vladimir Putin and others about the encroachment of NATO into Russian borderlands, right? Keir Giles, who's one of the leading British Russia uh, observers, uh, quotes a Russian joke that Russians only think a, a border is secure when it has a Russian soldier standing on both sides of it, right? <laughs> they want to they want to actually project power beyond their borders in order to have some kind of a buffer. Um, and remember, these guys have been invaded from the West four times in the last 200 years. Like, it's not a not an irrational fear, right? Um, secondly, and I, I quoted this in a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called The Dragons and the Snakes. Um, the Russians were indeed told, or at least they think they were told, by about a dozen Western leaders right at the period of the end of the Cold War, that NATO would not expand one inch to the East. And in fact, they withdrew uh, a thing called the group of Soviet forces in Germany, the most powerful military force on the continent, out of East Germany back to Russia on a promise given to them by a variety of people um, that uh, we wouldn't expand NATO to the east. And there's been a lot of political debate about that. 
in the US. But if you look at my book, I mean, I quote the actual archival diplomatic cables where we told each other that's what we told them, right? So it's not exactly secret. Um, so the Russians believe that we have done the dirty by since then, um, you know, uh, incorporating a whole variety of former Warsaw Pact countries right up to Russia's actual border. Now, if you talk to the Czechs or the Poles or to others, they will say, you didn't come east to us, we ran west to you, right? And it isn't at all surprising that countries like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, who suffered under, you know, horrific brutality from the Soviets for 50 years, uh, would want a guarantee of being part of NATO, right? So, um, you know, I think NATO is right to say, look, Russia doesn't get to tell these countries in Eastern Europe that they can't be part of NATO. Everyone has to have the freedom, uh, you know, to be able to join the alliance. But that's a different question from the sort of prudential alliance strategy question of whether it's smart to expand NATO right up to Russia's border, right? And I think you can you can say that it's legitimate for countries to join NATO, but simultaneously think that, um, you know, it, what we've done has been objectively, you know, quite threatening to the Russians. How they've chosen to react to that has been um, a, a variety of means. It's uh, low profile, sort of what's, what we often call gray zone maneuver until recently. What this is now is an overt attack on Ukraine, but I think we need to see it as not just targeting Ukraine, also sending a message to the Baltic states and to Finland and to, to Scandinavia and particularly to Poland and Romania that, um, you know, if we can do this to the Ukrainians, you know, a country of 44 million people, and we're willing to level these cities, you know, think about what we could do to you, right? So it's almost like, um, you know, sort of to use a bar fight and its analogy is, is they're picking the nearby little kid and beating the crap out of him in order to send a message to the, the powerful guys across the room, um, you know, do not screw with us. And I, I think that's a way to think about it. It's not the only way, but that's um, certainly one factor, I think, in what's going on in Ukraine right now. And I think that was a, a good summary. I, I, have, I, have, I have tiny quibbles with, with the framing, but I think broadly speaking, I think that articulates yeah, well, have, have the right. I, I don't have a monopoly. Give us, give us your- uh, Yeah, no, no, just, just in this. So A, I, as someone who's politics first, I'm, I'm, I'm very frustrated by this idea that, and once again, yes, various Western leaders did say various things to the Soviet Union regarding NATO expansion. But once again, you know, the George H.W. Bush administration wasn't even reelected. There was no, there was no treaty. There isn't a direct Western, we Western never document. Gave formal, we, we never gave the, them a formal promise. You know, it was a series of German leaders and French leaders, you know, Ed, James Baker, you know, people who are out of office a year later. Yeah, that's quite true. Yeah. And, and my thing is, and, and this is why I get so frustrated with, with the Russians, because once again, to your point, Napoleon, Hitler, all these, all these, you know, authoritarian dictators have used um, Ukraine, Poland, you know, Central Europe as a highway to get into Russia. And it's been completely devastating in all these various conflicts. So I am not questioning the fear. Once again, I'm driven by World War II. I understand why Russians are driven by World War II, but also World War I, which up until mm -hmm. the Soviet Union, they technically lost um, mm -hmm. to Germany in terms of um, the Treaty of Brett Litovsk. Um, and then Napoleon. I understand all of that. But and my Crimea, point of, don't forget the Crimean War, mate. Yeah, yeah, and the Crimean War. Yeah, we're <laughs> we're getting we're getting these, but once again, an important war there. But mm -hmm. here's where my frustration lies. If that assumption is true, every single move they've made has repudiated that story. So, mm -hmm. for example, the fact that up until now European countries weren't even meeting their defense, um, you know, two percent defense, but that that should factor in. So mm -hmm. once again, if it's if it's the 1930s and Hitler is rising, obviously the Soviets were allied with Hitler for a quick second there. But if Hitler is rising and everyone's raising money and Poland is talking about recreating the Poland Lithuanian Empire from the 15th century and President Biden is saying history is over, we're going to change Russia in a way that may have been more articulated in the 2000s, but was certainly done aka in the world where President Obama specifically said, we will not intervene because of Crimea. Mm -hmm. Every single act Russia has taken since then, I think, has been fueled by complete and total arrogance. So to your point, if the message here was, hey, Baltics, Central European countries, 
don't mess with us. They sent the exact opposite message. Mm -hmm. Sweden and Finland, they're not going to join NATO. That isn't going to happen, I think. But in all but name, they are effectively now joining the Western alliance against Russia. They are sending, um, they are sending um, weapons. You have um, Swedish and Finnish nationals like joining the Foreign Legion of Ukraine. Why then, given the story you just told, what, you know, in terms of, um, can, you've told the story of like, you know, uh, American arrogance after 9-11. Mm -hmm. What is the hubristic, poor analysis in my pr perspective that would lead you to make these miscalculations? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so we talked Napoleon. Let me give you a construct from Napoleon that I know you're aware of, and I'm sure your listeners are too. This notion of the strategic offensive, tactical defensive, right? So the idea is that you go to a place which by just the nature of where you are is offensive and threatening to an adversary, but then you adopt a defensive posture as a way to, um, you know, because uh, defense is stronger than attack. And, and this is a sort of Napoleon strategy that we've seen many times from him in his campaigns. The argument that you see from the Russians is NATO's on a strategic offensive, right? Over 20 years, it's moved closer and closer and closer and it's encroaching, but it's in a period of a short-lived period of tactical weakness because of a variety of factors. Um, and so, uh, you know, lack of defense spending, lack of unity, uh, across NATO nations until quite recently about things like sanctions, difference of opinion between the EU and NATO and the US, um, arguably a weak president, although we should come back to that because I think that's been blown out of proportion um, politically. Um, so Are you referring to Biden or, or Trump? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a sort of US political narcissistic argument about like Biden invited the invasion of, of, um, of Ukraine. Like that may have been one factor, right? But I think there are a lot of other factors in the Russian calculus. And I think we can, you know, we, we risk blowing out of proportion the importance of who's in the White House to Russian strategy, right? I think they're more looking at the West just had a major screw up in Afghanistan. It's disunited. Um, that COVID has brought significant domestic unrest in a lot of countries. You know, there's a variety of factors here that make it a good window of opportunity. Uh, plus you've got, Putin, who's 69, um, he's theoretically out of office in 2024, although he can extend that. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a limited closing window of opportunity to, you know, right what he sees as a massive historical wrong. Uh, and he, he thinks, you know what, when in the next 10 years am I going to have a better chance than now to move? The other factor for them is that the Ukrainians have been getting more and more weapons, bec becoming stronger doubling the size of their military or more actually more than doubling it and so you know it's almost a it's it's a closing window of opportunity right because if you don't move now uh ukraine gets stronger i think all of that goes into the calculus um and i think that you know the notion of nato expansion threatening russia is not made up in the same way as the nazi argument is but it it isn't the current top of mind you know for the russians i think it's for them it was we've got an opportunity here to do something about this and kind of set NATO back on its heels and reset the balance. You've done a good job of establishing the timeline here. So there, there were the 20 years of Russian policy and NATO policy up until the invasion. And there seems to me to be the initial few days where Kyiv was expected to fall, surrender, would have happened, the West would have backed down in the face of Russian aggression, but that didn't happen. So mm -hmm. what I'm incredibly curious about is what does this new playbook look like? Because mm -hmm. if you're, if you, if you are, if you are, once again, Vladimir Putin, we were talking about this at the start of the episode, and this is where the counterinsurgency bit comes in. Now this is turning into a protracted war. Um, because the quick decapitation, literal or figurative, of the um, Ukrainian leadership did not occur. And as I said before, with every single destroyed city block, the political legitimacy of any regime that follows installed by Putin weakens, weakens further. Also, it seems to me that with every single day, with every single additional bullet, plane, javelin, um, anti-tech weapon, the chances of the West or the broader democratic world, including countries like Japan, recognizing any puppet regime installed gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So the chances of achieving that political goal, AKA Ukraine that's 
formally aligned towards Russia, while also the West backing off seems weaker and weaker and weaker. So given that dynamic, you see this seems to be the perfect breeding ground for an insurgency. So I'd love for you just to respond to that and then just talk about insurgency in this context when you have a powerful state against a weaker state. Yeah. So, you know, of course, I'm going to see the potential for an insurgency here because that's what I do for a living, right? And of course, um, I'm going to book but, you to talk about that. So yeah, there's, yeah. A, stru- so there's take, a structural problem here. <laughs> right. So take, take what I'm going to say with a grain of salt. But I think, um, you know, it's a country of 44 million people. It's a very large country for by European standards. And the Russians right now have about 200,000 troops deployed. But a uh, proportion of those are conscripts who need to rotate out. So let's call it 150,000 ish professional troops in country. That is nowhere close to the number you would need to secure a country like that against a serious resistance warfare um, opposition, right? I'm going to use the term resistance warfare rather than insurgency. It looks very similar on the ground, but um, there's a subtle difference, which is insurgency typically is a population rising up against its own government or a, an occupying power. And what we're seeing here is a sort of uh, national resistance, probably with a government in exile um, in Western Europe somewhere, probably supported by uh, NATO or the EU, at least um, unofficially. And it, it looks more like sort of World War II resistance movements against occupation rather than a traditional sort of fully internal insurgency. On the Can we ground, pause real quick make- because mm-hmm. well, because this is actually very interesting historically. So. For example, under your rubric then, Iraq is an insurgency because there is a successor government to Saddam Hussein. In Afghanistan, there obviously was at the start like Hamid Karzai and then eventually Ashraf Ghani's government in Afghanistan that there is rebellion against. During the Vietnam War, you obviously have the, the Republic of Vietnam in, in the South. So, that, so that's why those examples, including the Viet Cong, that's an insurgency. But the point is, this is national resistance. Just, just to, is, that, is that the correct yeah. framing here? That's right. I mean, you should also just point out there's a political element to that, right? I mean, I, I got in massive trouble when I worked for the State Department for pointing out that the war in Iraq, when we were the occupying power, looked a hell of a lot more like resistance warfare than insurgency, right? Um, but of course, that makes us the Nazis in that analogy. So no one wants that, right? So we don't talk about it that way. But um, yeah, the so let's use Iraq as an example. It was resistance against occupation until the point at which we put a fully sovereign uh, Iraqi government in charge, you know, at the end of the surge. Since then, it's been an insurgency against that um, that government, right? Uh, Afghanistan's a slightly more complicated case. Um, anyway, the reason I mention that is because NATO, uh, in fact, the Swedes and the US put together, so not just NATO, put together a uh, thing called the resistance operating concept a number of years ago, talking about how countries that were subject to the kinds of gray zone operations that the Russians have been doing might resist, right? And there's a lot of work being done by the RAND Corporation, think tank in in DC and California, uh, and by others on how that would look. Um, What we've seen from the Russians is not the gray zone stuff we thought we were gonna see. This is fully conventional. Um, And so I think some of that resistance operating concept needs to be rethought a little bit. But the notion of sort of civilian resistance with a government in exile and a sort of remnant military force that's that's providing uh, the backbone for an insurgency, I think that's very much in the cards for Ukraine. And, and we should note that Ukraine has 25 of what are called territorial brigades that exist across the country. And they're sort of like local, they're not exactly National Guard, but they're sort of local military that are there to defend an area rather than act in an offensive fashion. And they work with local defense leagues in the community to create like a network defense. And that's very much coming into play now. That's why we're seeing a lot of the the civilian resistance um, working so well, because they've got this structure in place to to resist uh, against the the Russians. I think the chances of the Russians suppressing that are next to zero, um, even with huge firepower. Uh, There's already a significant peace movement in Russia, 7,000 arrests or so in the last week. You know, it's going to be very difficult for them to suffer lots of body bags coming home to Russia and not have significant issues back home. And I think it'd be hard for them to sustain that. So I think what you find the Russians trying to do most likely is what they did in the Georgian War of 2008, 
where they captured a key port in another city that allowed them to claim a victory, right? And basically allowed them to say, okay, we got what we came for. We, you know, we, we told you guys, we taught you a lesson, don't do it again, uh, or we'll come back, right? And so that gave them a sort of face saving off ramp, right? To, <clears throat> to get out of the, um, the situation they'd gotten themselves in. So the, right now they're trying to envelop Kiev. They're trying to capture Kharkiv and to secure the Southern coast of, um, of Ukraine. And if they, I think they're going to succeed in securing a land, bo- uh, land corridor from Russia to, uh, to the Crimea. And if they take Kharkiv or even Kiev, I think at that point, they would say, right, we've got what we came for. Now we're negotiating. Um, we're going to leave, but we've, we've taught you a lesson, right? Um, I'll just flag one other sort of deus ex machina possibility here, which is China, right? The Chinese have kept their powder dry so far. Um, and it's entirely possible that we might actually see China come out of the woodwork in the next week or two to resolve the conflict and act as kind of a quote unquote honest broker, uh, thereby putting themselves in a dominant position much in the same way that the US did during the Suez crisis in the 1950s, if you read as a listen. Could you explain, can you explain what happened there? Yeah, also 1956 um, happened to occur at the same time as the Hungarian uprising against uh, the Soviet Union, but um, Britain and France, and in concert with Israel, invaded the Suez Canal zone in Egypt against the, um, the new nationalist government of Gamal Abdel Nasser, the, the um, new... Uh, anti-Western president of Egypt. And the British and the French very much expected the Eisenhower administration to come off the benches and support them. They didn't coordinate um, with the US. Uh, The US was tied up trying to handle Hungary at the same time. And rather than support its European allies, the US instead came and said, we're not supporting this. This is crazy. Everybody go back in your box. Um, That the US resolved the crisis uh, and the British certainly and the French felt betrayed by the Eisenhower administration, but that really stamped the dominance of the US in that early Cold War period that, you know, US is the top dog, it doesn't hunt in a pack with the European empires, and it's going to, you know, it's going to be the one that decides outcomes. And so there's a less ambitious Chinese policy here, which might be to just support, um, you know, support Russia in order to troll the you know, own the West, right? Um, and and thereby uh, disrupt the Western dominated world order. That's a possibility. A more ambitious thing, I think, would be to come out and say, okay, we don't have a dog in this fight. We're the honest broker. We're a UN Security Council permanent member. Um, and we are now going to take the responsible course and solve this crisis. And at the end of that, China is the dominant player globally, right? Um, I don't see Xi Jinping saying anything that would lead you to think he's going to do that anytime soon, but it's a possibility we should be thinking about. Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating. There's so many things I want to hit here in our remaining time, but one, it seems to me the Chinese severely miscalculated by taking that very public meeting with Putin before this happened. Um, that picture yeah. of Xi and Putin together, smiling, almost even smirking, was a disaster because now that's why you're seeing it, it, it seemed to. The best case scenario, so like I said, let's go back to the example of Grozny, specifically West Syria, because that obviously had deeply international implications. That was a intra, inter-Russian conflict. Mm-hmm. The world may have condemned it. People may have said bad things over Boris Yeltsin. But that being said, it was, it was an internal matter. And when Putin was trying to go around with his a historical and unproductive essays saying we are one people, Ukrainian national identity is a lie, it doesn't exist. It seems to me that that was aimed at making this a Russian issue. But the second you have Russia and China together in a deeply ideological nature like this, that's why you're seeing Japan explore the idea of having nuclear, US nuclear missiles um, on, on, on their territory. That's why you're seeing Shinzo Abe talking about rearming um, J- 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 the Japanese military. They internationalized this conflict by taking mm-hmm. that meeting. And to your point, it's very difficult to see Xi able to argue he's an honest broker, given the leaks and the fact that everyone now knows that Russia informed China of this invasion happening before it occurred. Yeah, the difference no, here, to, to, to your Eisenhower point, Ike did not know or to the degree that she knew. This is this is as if, you know, um, 
Anthony Eden or I, I or um, I don't think it was Charles de Gaulle at the point, but whoever was in charge of France at that point. And then the prime minister of Israel traveled to D.C., took a meeting with Eisenhower in front of the White House. And then right. Ike claimed to not know and be an honest broker. Once again, why? Let's go to dragons and snakes real quick. It just seems to me that autocracies have made terrible political calculations for the last four years. And this seems to be at the height of one of those. What, what, what do you think is going on there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think. As interesting because I was I was having a, co- a conversation um, yesterday with a bunch of British military leaders, and um, one of them posed a really good question, which was, you know, have the Russians seen us adapting to their hybrid form of warfare, uh, and decided, you know what, the Americans and the and the Allies have gone hybrid, let's go back to conventional, right? So the argument I make in Dragons and the Snakes is that <clears throat> um, after 1991, the, the Gulf War we basically showed everybody not how not to fight us, right? If you go out conventionally in the open, arrayed in the way that Saddam did in 1991, the outcome is going to be some variant of the highway of death, right? It's just not a good way to, to operate. Um, my friend HR McMaster says there's two ways to fight the US, asymmetric and stupid, right? And, you know, people have realized that. And so what I chronicle in that book is how Russia, China, Iran, a number of others have adapted to come up with ways of operating that invalidate our very conventional, you know, battlefield centric way of war. And arguably that's what that Russian playbook has been for the last 20 years. And we've been reacting to that. It's probably my fault as much as anybody else's by saying, Hey, there's all this gray zone stuff going on. We need to get better at counter hybrid. We need to get better at information warfare, you know, focusing on that. And it's possible as this British general said yesterday that um, the Russians saw us adapting to that and went, oh, okay, well, let's just go back to conventional, right? Um, and I think that's a factor for sure. I think also this perception of Western weakness in the wake of um, the, the debacle in Afghanistan is another factor. Um, and a, a perception that we tend to rely overly heavily on economic measures rather than military measures. And, you know, I do think we miscalculated a bit there, particularly by saying right up front, we're taking all military measures off the table. Um, We left ourselves with only economic sanctions. And, you know, I'm not 100% sure that Putin sees the oligarchs losing their money as a bad thing, right? I mean, they're a rival power center to Putin. Their power comes from their money. It might be a feature, not a bug, right, for for Putin if if the oligarchs get weakened here. So I think we, we sort of took the military you know, um, and made them better at doing counter hybrid, which by definition meant that we weren't so focused on the kind of conventional threat that we're seeing now. We also telegraphed weakness and disunity. Um, and I don't, I'm not talking about President Biden here. I'm talking about a broader set of issues across the full European alliance of which the president just won. Um, but, you know, and there was this window of opportunity and they thought, you know what, let's, let's have a go. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing now. You know, that's, such a fascinating argument because it gets to why this is a obviously morbid topic, but it's really interesting. On a pure military level, I agree. Ideally, you would have had more strategic ambiguity as to whether or not we would intervene in Ukraine if Russia invaded. We have that sort of ambiguity when it comes to Taiwan. And in that case, I think that probably plays a stabilizing role in terms of our relationship with China. The issue, though, is that in terms of U.S. domestic politics, what I can tell you, though, is that Biden taking that option off the table effectively prevented him from being undercut. So this no longer, it, so on a domestic politics level, this changed this, him taking troops off the table entirely put all of the onus on Putin, which I think domestically, this isn't maybe the optimal military result, but I think this was the optimal result for keeping the US engaged yeah. on Ukraine's side. But it, you have I to balance, that, and that's why it's a fascinating thing yeah. to balance. Well, I think that's true, right? And I, you know, I've noticed people on the right likening President Biden to, to uh, Neville Chamberlain, right? Which frankly is, is a little bit unfair to Neville Chamberlain, right? I mean, Neville, Neville Chamberlain after Munich was the guy who rearmed the British Empire, right? He was the guy who declared war on Hitler after the um, invasion of Poland. And arguably part of Chamberlain's strategy in 39 and uh, 38 and 39 was maneuvering Hitler into a position where he was in the moral wrong and the West was morally right 
so that when the time came, they had the support of the world in in fighting the Nazis. And that's not a you know not a sort of historical revisionist point of view. That's like the understood um, you know historical record now with respect to to Chamberlain. Um, and I think you know appeasement has a bad name rightly because um, weakness can be provocative. It can telegraph, hey, there's a window of opportunity to attack. But I think th there's a trade-off, right, between being morally in the right, giving you the um, basis to be able to retaliate, um, you know, uh, in, a, in an effective way versus, um, you know, leaving it too long to react. And it's a judgment call. Um, and I think to the, to the red line issue, you know, like taking military stuff off the table and telegraphing exactly what our red lines um, were, <clears throat> that has a bad name because of what happened in Syria in 2013 when President Obama had very clearly stated a red line and then failed to follow through when the Syrians launched that chemical attack on their own population. But it has a long history in US policy, going back to the Korean War, actually, you know, the famous incident where the State Department accidentally left South Korea off their list of places they would defend against communism. And Stalin read that and went, oh, okay, you know, maybe we can move on, on South Korea. And everyone was very scarred by that. And, you know, we've, we've tried to be very clear about what our, our red lines are in most cases since. But as you rightly point out, there's some value to creative ambiguity, right? If you're playing the kind of strategy that Putin has been playing, um, one of the key factors for you is understanding what's gonna trigger a response and what form is that response going to take, right? Um, it's almost like one of those Hollywood movies where the bad guys hit the bank vault and they're like, right, the cops will be here in seven minutes with like 15 guys. You know, if you can if you can map the parameters of how a response is going to look, that allows you to plan. Um, again, on the right, people are saying, well, Trump was such a great president. That's why um, Putin didn't move on Ukraine. Yeah, that's possible. Um, certainly, um, Biden telegraphed some weakness when he said... Um, you know, a, a minor incursion would be okay, you know. Um, but I think there was another factor with Trump, which was the guy was just so unpredictable, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you don't know how the, how the president's going to react, uh, you know, one day he does nothing, another day he's like, right, let's kill Soleimani, you know. Um, and whatever he sees first thing in the morning when he wakes up drives his policy agenda for the day. It's really hard to plan that kind of strategy against a president who's so unpredictable. When you get a more quote, responsible president who's, you know, when when elected, Biden said he wanted a predictable and stable relationship with Russia, right? So clearly that predictability was a key factor for, for President Biden. Well, that just makes us more predictable for this kind of approach. But I think to your very first point in the whole conversation, Russians have badly miscalculated here, right? Um, and this is probably not where they want it to be. It's not the re reaction they're expecting. And I think now they're forced to reorganize their entire campaign on the fly. And they're historically not very good at that. So yeah, we've got 15 minutes left. So I want to not rapid fire, take as long as you need, but I just want to hit Thanks. these very apparent questions. So your, your background um, is obviously in the Australian military. And whenever I speak with um, people from your age cohort, a lot of their mentalities were shaped during the Cold War. So they were, you know, H.R. McMaster, famously, like when he's at West Point, his expectation is he's going to become a tank commander and go to West Germany to protect against a Soviet invasion. There's really that frame there. Your, your, your frame when you are coming in is there is this Russian Soviet bear. It's very powerful. They probably, we all know, like U.S. troops are referred to as tripwire forces. Western Europe sans nuclear weapons is conquered by, by the Soviets. I've been struck by how incompetent the Russian military seems to be. What's, and, and pushed back on this is untrue, but I think what feels frustrating to me is obviously I don't support U.S. intervention because of the nuclear risk. But it seems to me that if the U.S. did decide to intervene, this Russian army is not the Soviet army, even with Putin's 20 years of reform. So this army he has right now is a better army than it was during the 1990s. There are conscripts, but there is even fewer conscripts than there used to be. What is going on with the Russian army when it comes to these logistical issues, when it comes to the inability to just perform, not you know the street to street fighting, but the basic details of logistics in those parts? Yeah, so um, we should come back to nukes, right? Because the, the Russians think about nuclear weapons completely different from, differently from how we do. But in terms of the conventional Russian forces, um, 
there were significant reforms known as the new look reforms um, between 2008 and about 2011. Um, and a number of features of that was reacting to what the Russians thought were poor performances in Georgia and in Chechnya. And they certainly are dramatically better than they were then. They are also better equipped um, with more advanced weaponry. And, you know, they're just a, a more professional, better organized force than they were. But a lot of what we're seeing from them is the classic screw ups that we saw, you know, going back again to the Soviets in the Cold War, bad logistics, sticking to the roads, um, not planning in a way that allows you to be flexible when the situation changes, heavy reliance on firepower, use of conscripts in sort of overly simplistic maneuvers where junior commanders don't have a lot of freedom to maneuver, uh, attempt to quickly overpower using special forces. And then when that fails, going to the, the sledgehammer. You know, these are all things that we've seen from the Russians and from the Soviets before them, going back to, you know, when I was a junior officer studying, you know, the Russians in Afghanistan. I mean, this is, this is, the, um, this is the stuff that they do. It is surprising, I think, that they haven't been more professional. Um, but I, I don't think it's that surprising when you look at their, their previous combat performance in um, a, a variety of theaters. So, you know, we can talk nukes as well, but I, I think the- Yeah, please, nukes, go there. Yeah, well, so- Russia has about 4,500 nukes, significantly more than, than the US does. More importantly, though, the Russians have a much more extensive tactical nuclear weapon or non-strategic nuclear weapon stockpile, um, as little as 0.1 to 0.3 of a kiloton. So like, you know, the, the Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. So these are, we're talking about much smaller weapons and the Russians battle, have so always, battle so battlefield nukes battlefield nuclear weapons right and the, the Russians have always regarded nuclear weapons as kind of a, a species of large artillery rather than how we look at them which is a sort of militarily unusable species of super weapon that you know would lead to uh, the end of the world if you were to use them that's not how the Russians think about them um and uh Russian nuclear strategy this is a disputed concept by the way um, the, the notion of retaliatory, retaliatory or de-escalatory strikes, um, something some people call escalate to de-escalate. That the sounds notion, like an oxymoron. <laughs> I know, yeah, I, it's, and it, it, we could get into it, but it, it's a big debate in the, in the Russia Watcher community. But um, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, Russian nuclear strategy involved the notion that in the event of a major non-nuclear attack on the nation, that the use of a first strike nuclear weapon would be considered acceptable. And the notion there was, you know, imagine you've got a US force in the middle of the Atlantic sailing to Europe to be part of a war against Russia. What if the Russians nuke the ships at sea, right? With like one of the nuke, tactical nuclear weapons. Yeah, or even, even a, a larger one, right? If, and okay. you know, it's at sea, there's no civilians, there's limited environmental damage. It isn't a, a city that you're knocking out. And the calculus was it would be irrational for the US to retaliate and trigger a global thermonuclear exchange just because they lost a, a fleet at sea, right? But they wouldn't necessarily send another one. I mean, wow, you know, it's a big gamble, right? But that was the sort of discussion at the time um, that it might be rational to use nukes on that kind of a target. More, um, more tactically, on the, in a land theater, the, a lot of the Russian missiles, like the Iskander Ms that have been fired in the last few weeks, can be either nuclear or non-nuclear and can be used to sort of clear a path for a ground force to push through. Now think about the, you know, if you're pushing a, an armored column of Russians through an area that you just nuked, like a lot of those people are gonna die, right? From just the radiation. So it's an incredibly cynical and brutal way to treat your own troops. And I think it'd be, it'd be a huge step for the Russians to do that in terms of losing popular support, but it will just, I'll just say it's in their doctrine, right? It's something that they could theoretically think of doing in extremists. Um, and it's very different from how we think about nuclear weapons. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. We're getting to the counterinsurgency part. So <clears throat> historically at, at a theoretical level, a, a key, and I don't need, this is more for the audience. I don't need to tell you don't, I don't need to educate you. <laughs> Um, on this, on the, you wrote a book called Counterinsurgency. So uh, apologies for the condescension, but it, historically an important factor in successful insurgencies has been um, borders um, in the sense that um, why do the Philippines, why, why do Filipinos ultimately fail to um, 
defeat the U.S. after the Spanish-American War. After the um, the war there, it's because they are a there. It's an island, and at a practical level, and they're not supplied by anyone. And the U.S. effectively was able to do that. But what do you see in Vietnam? You see the border with China, where supplies pour in. Where, for a variety of obviously nuclear and Cold War reasons, the U.S. is not going to interdict or launch a war against there. You know, in in, in Pakistan, you have that with um, the Afghan war. In Iraq, you have that with, with Syria. So there's this consistent history of successful insurgencies, or, and this didn't quite work in Iraq, but insurgencies that could wage protracted, costly struggles that limit the political objectives of the, of the occupier. In this case, you have this border with um, Western Europe, not just Western Europe, but NATO countries, where once again, you're seeing supplies come in. How does this dynamic play into the into, into Russian thinking? Because this isn't just like, oh, you're going over the mountains into, into Afghanistan. This is like straight up easy land borders, where on Twitter, we're seeing people say X number of bullets are crossing into the country now. How, how are they thinking about that? Yeah, well, the short answer to that is we don't know, right? Because the Russians haven't been very public about their current thinking on a on a potential um, protracted war. In fact, it, to the extent that we know what they were thinking, it seems they were hoping and expecting a, a short war. Um, but if we do get into a protracted conflict, you're absolutely right that what counterinsurgency people call sanctuary or safe haven on the other side of the border will immediately become an issue for the Russians, even if they're able to secure the whole of Ukrainian territory, which isn't necessarily feasible, right? Um, then they're gonna have a, a significant problem with infiltration of fighters and weapons and medical supplies and advisors and all that kind of stuff uh, from Western Europe. And it's very, very difficult to, to control uh, you know, a country when you have that. Now, one possibility might be that instead of um, trying to occupy all of Ukraine. They, there's, there's a town, town called Dnipro, which is on the Dnipro River, which runs through the middle of um, Ukraine. And it's possible that they might try to link up the southern and northern thrusts. I mean, if you look at a map right now, it looks kind of like, kind of like a set of jaws closing on, um, on Ukraine from the east and the sort of teeth, right? The, the thrust north mm -hmm. from, from uh, Crimea and south from Kharkiv, you could potentially link that up along the Dnieper River and then Russia controls Eastern Ukraine and it has a river and a defendable border, more defendable, that would allow it to try to, um, to control the, that portion of the country. Still an enormous challenge, right? You're still talking about 20 odd million people, but you know, more so than, uh, than trying to control the whole of the country. I, I don't think the Russians wanna do that. I think they wanna do a deal. They want a new regime in, in Kyiv that will do that deal. And short of that, they wanna, you know, find some kind of face-saving way to declare victory and leave. But if they do get drawn into a, a protracted uh, counterinsurgency, that's the sort of, you know, extreme measures they might have to think about. And this is where it gets fascinating, where because once again, it seems to me the takeaway is this was premised on a three-day shock and awe style campaign. But with every single day, with every single Ukrainian death, with at, at this point, um, if Zelensky, you know, you could have, who, 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 I, I'm, I'm not sure the degree to which the, the, the claims about an assassination attempt on Zelensky in the first few days were accurate or not, but should that happen at this point, that seems to be a political disaster right? from Russia. I'd much rather exile, um, exile him than, than, than cause a death in terms of a pure martyrdom issue. But at, at this point though, how could, why, why wouldn't there be an insurgency against the Russian puppet regime? Because because, oh, because 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 it seems to me it seems to me that you're you're talking about an off ramp, but it seems to me after those after they went beyond the breakaway republics and after they couldn't finish it in three days, we're way past the off ramp in terms of what their long term political interest would be, aka a stable friendly regime that's leaned towards Russia away from the West. Yeah, so you, you're making a great point, and I hadn't actually thought of that, but I, but it, it 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 is a very sensible way to think about it, right? That you know, from the Russian standpoint, what's better, right? A Finlandized or neutralized um, Ukrainian government still headed by Zelensky, or some kind of quisling regime that um, Ukrainian people don't see as legitimate. Oh, wait, and one quick and one and one quick thing that also would not be seen by the West as legitimate right. at this point, yeah. especially if especially if Zelensky escapes. <laughs> 
or some form of government exile exists. Yeah. That, that I mean, if, if Russia is a pariah state, that Quisling government is even more of a pariah state. Absolutely. And, you know, right now, Zelensky is arguably the leader of the free world, right? And he's a hero to a lot of people. And if he were to come out and say, look, we fought hard, we fought well, we're doing a deal um, in order to save Ukraine, it'd be very hard for people not to support that, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think you're, you're quite right about that. I think that would be the, the ideal outcome from the Russian standpoint. But again, that's not necessarily how these things go, right? It may very well be that there's a GRU Spetsnaz team out there right now hunting Zelensky who don't have communications and are going to whack the guy just because that was the last direction they were given, right? Um, or he gets caught up in a bombing or whatever. Like once you start a war, you know, as George W. Bush could tell you, right? Um, the outcome by definition is unpredictable. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a point at which the Russians don't get to decide what, what happens here, you know? But yeah, I think um, Quisling regime, not a good outcome. Um, Zelensky doing a deal, obviously the ideal outcome, but would the deal that Zelensky would be willing to do be acceptable to the Russians? And I'm, you know, we're all, we're all rooting for, the Ukrainians here, but you know, it's ultimately going to be their call. So last two questions. One would be the US obviously spent 20 years um, fighting insurgencies. What have the Russians learned from our failures and successes in that mission? Both the Russians and the Chinese, I think, have watched us very carefully. There was a period uh, in the early 2000s where the Russians were very friendly in their attempt to offer us advice. And there's actually a Russian general staff history of the war in Afghanistan that was circulated um, around that time frame as hugely useful series of lessons. Um, and we were sort of arrogantly blowing off the Russians and saying, you know, how we're the Americans, don't you know, like we're gonna, we're gonna show you guys what you should have done. Um, and I, there's a certain amount of Schadenfreude, I'm sure, in, in, uh, in Russia when we got our asses kicked last year. So, you know, I think um, they've watched what we've done. They've realized we've got a number of weaknesses, right? And they have, um, I think, calculated that in the wake of that 20 years of conflict, we no longer have the stomach or the internal cohesion in the West to sustain another protracted conflict against Russia. Um, and I think they miscalculated on the basis of not understanding Ukrainian resolve. And the fact that the Ukrainians have fought so hard means that the economic sanctions will now have time to bite, right? And it may be that part of Putin's calculation about sanctions was, yeah, you can impose sanctions, but we will have overthrown the Ukrainian regime before they can have any effect. So they're, they're, they're rather meaningless. Well, that's not true anymore, right? So I think that they've watched what we did. They've watched the struggle. Um, they've learned how to oppose us, but I think they've miscalculated. Uh, in this particular case, do you have do you have five minutes past the hour? Sure, mate. Yeah, whatever you need. Uh, yeah, all right, cool. Um, yeah, because you keep when people say interesting things. I my specialty is follow up, so I, I have to go oh. there. Let me clarify what I meant by learn from our twenty year experience. I meant counterinsurgency. What so you know history once again don't have to tell you this history, but the history of the um, second Iraq war is we basically spend a decent part of the first term of the Bush administration denying there's an insurgency. You have Donald Rumsfeld; he's very recalcitrant, and then with 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 the surge, Petraeus, your experience at the State Department, et cetera, you you see this shift to there is an insurgency. We have to deal with this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, what from the counterinsurgency experience have they learned? Yeah, well, I think um, a lot, right? And we've seen significant evolution in Russian counterinsurgency uh, technique, right? Since that early period in Chechnya, which where we talked about with with sledgehammers, you know, um, building alliances with local partners who may want to work with them. That's a, a lesson we saw them applying in um, in, in Syria, um, but also in Chechnya in the second war. Um, and, you know, I think the other big issue that we saw them applying in Syria was doing local peace deals with communities as a way of ending conflict in a particular area and getting people to leave, right? So um, there, there's been a sort of e evolution in their approach. But remember that there's, there's like a two-speed Russian military, right? There are the, the GRU and the, and the special forces and SSO, which is their equivalent of like Delta Force and a whole variety of like high-end players who know how to do this stuff well. And then there's the big conscript, you know, heavy metal, 
army that isn't so good at it, much like we had, right, when we went into mm-hmm. Iraq. And I think their ability to adapt the, the larger force to this kind of conflict is going to be slower, right, than, than what they've done in, in, in the last 20 years. Yeah. Something people are no doubt curious about are tactical decisions around weapons. So obviously, the key weapons in Iraq and Afghanistan are the IED, the IFP um, tactics that take advantage of um, the nature of U.S. forces. So the IFP, um, you know, this is a special type of IED that was basically supported by um, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that was particularly devastating to our early armored forces. You have the MRAPs come in. It's a little complicated. The point is like that the IED was, like you said, the way to harm American troops wasn't standing and fighting on the highway. It was let them come into the city and then use IEDs and IFPs to really devastating accounts. We're seeing in social media lots of pictures of Molotov cocktails. Now there's a propaganda war going on, obviously. I think that's very important. The Molotov cocktail, especially um, to Western audiences, is very important um, very, very important imagery, AK-47s that also has, you know, has this weapon of like national liberation of very, you know, it's on the flag of like some African country. This is an important idea. But what do you think are the ideal ways of tactically combating the Russian army? Because it seems like the, the Molotov cocktail doesn't seem to actually be it, given the dynamic of the fight you're facing. Yeah, Molotov cocktails are pretty good against dismounted infantry who haven't been trained to deal with them. Uh, but a trained infantry unit knows how to how to douse somebody that that's you know been set on fire. It's it's part of the counter riot training that people do. Um, older design armored vehicles are vulnerable if you hit them on the air intake um, with a, with a Molotov cocktail, and that can actually um, you know snuff out the engine uh, and cause them to stall. But you got to be pretty lucky. Um, uh, I think I get a, close too. Like that, it seems close. like they, so it's not just yeah. the dowsing, it's like that tactic specific that requires some close, close quarters. Yeah, it's not just a question of how far can you throw a five pound wine bottle full of gasoline, it's how far can you throw it when someone's shooting at you, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, it's tricky, right? But um certainly uh I think the the more significant weapon and one that is flooding in now to uh, Ukraine and something that the Ukrainians are going to have to husband very carefully if they want to sustain an effort is uh, the um, man-launched or man-portable, as they describe it. It's mostly men, I guess, Um, uh, anti-armor weapons. So the Javelin, FGM-148, which is American design, uh, I think called the Enlor, which is the British equivalent of that, variety of older weapon systems that are coming in from Finland and elsewhere. Um, essentially are what are known as top attack weapons. So you can launch them from a distance, they climb and then attack a target from above. And that has that's typically where tanks are quite weak. Tanks and armored vehicles are weak in their, in their top armor. Um, the Russians have done a number of adaptations to make their armored vehicles more defendable against those. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, that has improved it, but they're still quite vulnerable. And you can look at just the pictures of destroyed uh, Russian armored vehicles from the last week, many of which were knocked out by um, these kinds of things. Tactically, it's about ambushing rather than IEDs, right? So you've got a um, you've got a um, a Russian military that's very road bound, and you attack the front and the rear uh, vehicle, pin them in that street, and then just go to town with you know heavy weapons on them. That's the sort of stuff that was done to us a lot in. Iraq, uh, the Russians are certainly aware of that problem, uh, but it's something I think we would we would be likely to see. Um, and then the other thing, and it's a you know dirty little fact about insurgency, you don't necessarily gain the most mileage by attacking Russian combat troops in the front. You gain the most mileage by attacking logistics units, support units, and frankly, the civilian population that supports the Russians, right? That's why insurgencies rapidly turn into civil wars and get very violent and grubby because the easy target to attack is civilians. Um, So I think that potentially is where it goes. And I think the Ukrainian government, which right now very much has the moral high ground, is going to want to preserve that and is going to want to avoid getting involved in any of those kinds of attacks. But it's really hard to Um, to to avoid getting sucked into that. And of course, there's the problem of fake news and Russian propaganda and false flags and all that in terms of presenting 
um, you know, falsehood as truth. And I think we might see a lot of that play out as an important element in, in the event of a, uh, of a conflict like this. Well, Dave, this has been in- incredible, a real masterclass. We, we're, we actually move a lot of books on this show. So could you, you've written a million things. Can you just shout <laughs> out? Um, cause this is weird. Like, you know, books you've written back in 08 are actually quite relevant right now. Know, so can you just, weird, it? yeah. it's right. The cycle there. So can you, um, yeah, I yeah. wanted to talk more about, um, 2008, 2010, Dave, even 2013, Dave, than 2020, Dave. Um, but can you just shout out all of your books? We'll yeah, put them in I mean, our we'll, bookshop we should, and go from there. We should do this again sometime, right? I mean, the, the conflict isn't going away and I think yeah. we'll be able to have another. Um, so my first book was called the accidental gorilla, which we've talked about already and, uh, has a fair bit in it about how, uh, you know, counterinsurgency and insurgency work. Um, I've written a number of books about ISIS and um, the the wars in Iraq and and Afghanistan and Libya and so on. The most recent one that I think is relevant here is called um, The Dragon and the Snakes, which has a big Russia chapter. Um, I actually went the entire length of the Russian Norwegian border with a special unit that sort of hides in the woods up there and um, saw a lot of really interesting Russian stuff up close. Uh, and talked a lot in that book about the evolution of uh, of, of Russian thinking since the Cold War. Uh, and I've, there's another, also a, a China chapter in, in that book um, where I talk about what the Chinese have learned um, in part by watching the Russians. So yeah, um, The Dragons and the Snakes is that book. Oxford University Press uh, 2020 came out just in time for the, the pandemic. Um, but it, I think it's probably going to need a rewrite once we see how, uh, how this thing goes in, in Ukraine. Well, Dave, um, best of uh, luck in the coming weeks, and we will definitely do this again. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, Really great.